Afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining uh, this afternoon's webinar. Um, the topic today is the value of asset visibility and traceability. So we have a great uh, uh, lineup of speakers today, um, which uh, we've got here. So I've got myself and the EMEA Regional Product Manager from Zebra. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two uh, people from our partner, I, the IOTA Foundation, uh, first being Jens, uh, who's the head of global trade and supply chains at the IOTA Foundation, who you may have seen in previous webinars that we've done with IOTA. And then we've also got Jose, uh, who's the, uh, the tech lead at IOTA, who's going to run a great demo. And then we're also really uh, excited to have Nick here, who's from uh, director from the, the Saffron Grange Vineyard, who's going to talk about, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of industry on the topic today. So the agenda is as follows. Um, we are going to uh, start with Nick, who's going to uh, focus on the topic at hand um, or, or talk from, from his perspective on um, traceability and provenance and why um, uh, these things are important from a, uh, the perspective of the wine industry where, where he works. And then we're going to go over to talking about uh, how traceability and provenance can be enabled um, from uh, our partnership uh, with IOTA. So ours focused on the data capture and locationing side and uh, IOTA's perspective from the, um, the perspective of the decentralization of um, data storage and data sharing. Then we're gonna have a really uh, great demo that we're gonna show. And uh, we're gonna finalize the, uh, finish off the webinar by uh, talking about where to find out more and where you can go away and do some testing. Uh, and then we'll wrap up and have some time for Q&A. Uh, so um, just to sort of uh, give you context on the flow, we're gonna start off quite high level, uh, not technical at all. And then towards the end, it's gonna get quite technical. We'll have some architectural slides and of course the demo. Um, so that's going to be the flow. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the um, Q&A box on the side as we're talking, and uh, we'll definitely get to those at the end. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nick. Hi, Alex. Hi. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak. So um, my name's Nick Edwards. I am um, speaking today from Saffron Grange Vineyard. Um, Saffron Grange is a vineyard which is based in Northwest Essex um, in England. So we are about 20 minutes south of Cambridge and about 20 minutes north of London Stansted for those that aren't, uh, aren't from England. Um, we are a vineyard that um, produces solely English quality sparkling wines. Um, we're a relatively new vineyard. We, um, as a vineyard, planted our first vines back in 2008. Um, and uh, since then, we've gradually planted more and more. We're now a six hectare vineyard. So we're a very small vineyard in the, I guess, the concepts of the, the global wine industry. Um, but we're quite similar to the majority of, of most vineyards in England. And a lot of them are relatively small. It's sort of an industry which is dominated by a few large players. Um, we only grow sparkling wine, make produce sparkling wines. We grow Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, uh, the three sort of traditional champagne grape varietals. And we also grow two other cooler climate grape varietals, which are Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris. Now, we planted our vineyard in Northwest Essex um, for a number of reasons, but the, the most important reason for us was really the, the location. So the location itself is on um, 200 feet of chalk. So that's exposed chalk. And um, it's that same chalk ridge, which actually flows down um, across, across England, um, across, the, across the channel and down into the famous um, wine growing areas of Northern France, so Champagne, Northern Burgundy, so Chablis. And, and, and it's really that chalk combined with the climate for us, which is why we planted our, our vineyard where we did. Um, our part of, um, of England, which is in, East Anglia is actually one of the driest parts of the country. And um, it's that combination of the 
the the the sun the the dry climate and what is a very long growing season which is why we decided to plant um our vineyard where we did and we although we've planted 13 years ago we launched our first vine uh, wines for sale in 2019 and that was off the 2016 vintage so all of the sparkling wines that we produce um in um in saffron walden which is where we're based are produced made use using the traditional method so that's the the champagne method where the secondary fermentation takes place in bottle so what we're producing is effectively a, a high quality um quite costly um product but one which is uh, something which we're very proud of um you may have noticed the woolly mammoth that you can probably see behind me and on on the bottle itself i was just asked by uh by Alex and, and the team earlier, why the woolly mammoth? And that's because they, they actually, they found the tusks and the teeth of the woolly mammoth in the, uh, in the river that runs on the bottom of the river of the vineyard. Um, and we, we felt he was a nice symbol, nice emblem um, and represented our brand well and was very memorable. Some, we also didn't have a chateau in this north part of Essex. So we thought it was a good, a good, a good emblem for us. Um, so that's effectively why Saffron Grange, um, why we planted where we did. As I said, we um, we only produce sparkling wines and we're lucky enough to say that all of our wines have been award winning. Um, and we're currently in the process of um, entering our third year as a vineyard. And the growing season for us starts in about now, about April time. Um, we're, we're about a week or two away from bud burst, which is where um, frost season is a, is a big challenge for us. Um, and then we pick our grapes in October. So normally middle, second or third week in October is when we pick our grapes. So it's a very nice long growing season, which helps with um, getting some of those aromatic characteristics of the wine, um, uh, which we believe really helps to just make our products sort of stand out from others. Um, Alex, I, I don't know if you you can move to the next I'm slide. Like, sorry, uh, let me just uh, take the screen back. Can you see my screen now? There we go, perfect. Um, so yeah, that was us. So, so the English and Welsh wine industry is a relatively relatively new wine industry. It's one which has been going on for some time, but I think it's fair to say in the last 10, 15 years, it's become a much more serious industry. Um, as I said earlier, it's dominated by a few large players. So uh, for those that are based in, in England, you may well have come across the names of Night Timber, Chapel Down, um, Rathfinney. There are some big names that have planted quite sizable um, hectareage in terms of the vineyards. But there are about 770 vineyards. This count was done I know, at the end of last year, um, of which 165 of those have wineries or have, are affiliated to wineries. So the majority of vineyards won't necessarily make their wines themselves, which we are one of those. We don't currently have a, have a winery. Um, so our grapes are grown, hand-picked, and then taken to our winery where the wine is then produced and then taken back to us. So that's an important point from the supply chain perspective. Um, it's predominantly an industry which is made up of sparkling wine because we are very much a cool climate. Um, as Champagne is in France, it's the most northern northernmost part wine region in France. We are at 52 degrees latitude and they used to say that, that you can only grow wine between 30 and 50 degrees latitude. We're right at the extremities of where you can grow. Um, sparkling wine but because of um the, the 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 climate and the warming climate um we're able to do things now that we weren't able to do even 10 years ago so certainly on our vineyard chardonnay where we, when we first planted it we were struggling to ripen that year on year but now every year it's it's really ripening so um that's testament sadly one of the one of the uh, positives that's come out of global warming is from a wine industry it's meant that england is effectively where Champagne once was 20 years ago um, from a climate perspective. So in Champagne, they pick their grapes um, they get earlier and earlier each year. So they, I think they last picked last year, middle of August. Um, we picked our grapes middle of October. So another two months on the vine really helps with um, developing some of those characteristics that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's an industry which has had a massive, um, a, a massive amount of investment in the last 10 years, the English wine industry. As you can see, um, its total hectares plant has gone up over 150 percent in in the last 10 years so a, a massive amount so much so that actually some of the champagne houses themselves have bought land and planted vineyards in england obviously they can't call it champagne because it's not not in champagne but they're seeing 
the value of English sparkling wine, the fact that it's a very popular product and the quality that it's able to produce. So Tattinger, um, Pommery are just two of the big champagne houses that have planted significant vineyards in England. And, and the investment is continuing. You want to move on to the next slide, please, Alex? Thank you very much. So yeah, so from a, um, I, I guess, relevance to this conversation today, the wine industry is a really interesting one. Um, provenance is clearly absolutely fundamental to um, to wine and to, to sparkling wine. It, it's really why everyone everyone has their own story of why what makes their wines different. And, and certainly um, for us, as I mentioned to you, it's really that combination of the, the location, the soil, um, the climate, and the methods in which um, the, the grapes themselves are grown uh, and being able to protect that provenance and um, prove that provenance is, is really important. And for a small vineyard like, like ourselves, clearly um, uh, the, 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 the counterfeit of wine isn't something that we have any issues with, um, but the bigger, the bigger winemakers obviously certainly do. And, you know, our product retails in, in England at around 30 pounds a bottle, 32 pounds a bottle for our sort of top end. Um, some sparkling wines obviously retail at much more than that. I mean, when you go to in Champagne, you're talking some of the, the big the big Champagne houses and their prestige cuvées, you can be spending three, four hundred pounds um, a bottle. So the value of the product itself is, is a relatively high value item. Um, and it's one in which clearly from a supply chain, is it an interesting one because it, it once it's produced, um, certainly for us as a small vineyard that doesn't have a winery on site at the moment, the grapes are picked and those grapes are then transported to the winery. Um, they're then produced in the winery and then uh, bottled. And then once they've been bottled, they're then aged for, our wines are aged for minimum two years on the lees and then another year on top of that in the bottle. So it's three years of aging. So the product itself is then is picked, is then produced, bottled, and then sold. And once it's sold, it goes through quite a long supply chain. So again, from our perspective, we sell our wines to uh, mostly cellar door sales, so direct to the consumer. But um, about 30, 40% of our wines are sold to uh, through distribution route. And that distribution route may be through a distributor and then through the shop, a retail shop, and then, then to the customer themselves. So, uh, but when you're talking about the larger wine industry, it can go through a number of different distributors and a number of different wholesalers before it ends up with the customer themselves. So there's a lot of places in which the bottle of wine or the case of wine um, could go missing, um, uh, could potentially be stolen, and from a counterfeit perspective, could be counterfeited. Um, now, clearly, the day that saffron grange is counterfeited is a day that is a day is a good day for us because it means we've made it and um, it's a wine which is worth counterfeiting. But certainly for the bigger players, it's it's an it's a it's an issue and it's something which um, technology clearly could play a really important part in um, helping to, I guess helping to eradicate. Um, but from our perspective, um, our wines, uh, the, the grape itself, being able to prove that the grapes that you have picked and you've grown and you've hand, you've hand grown and, and cared for, then make it into your bottle of wine. Um, that's something which um, as well, technology could play an important part of. So for us, um, the, the traceability of that wine, that grape into the bottle of wine, um, it is something which is really important to us. And we, um, we're we part of an, a, a PDO, which is Protected Designation of Origin, which is an, accredi an accreditation, which basically allows you to prove that your grapes have been grown in a specific way and harvested in a specific way with, with volumes. And the, the final end product of the wine itself meets certain regulations and has adheres to a number of rules. And that, that bottle of wine itself, to be able to get that PDO accreditation um, gets tested um, gets tested in, in two different ways. And, and they test for um, the grape variety, they test on the age and the alcohol limit. And, and, and like with a lot of the wine regions, there are specific regulations which, um, which you have to adhere to to be able to class your wine as a PDO wine. So an English quality sparkling wine, as opposed to just an English wine. Um, so again, that's something which we believe technology itself um, potentially could help to support the smaller vineyards but also sort of the bigger vineyards in terms of justifying what is a as i said a relatively expensive product so that was kind of um 
a summary in my eyes of of hopefully a, a case study which you can all relate to as a small a small vineyard but one in which hopefully opens uh opens up some nice uh, thoughts and, and leads on nicely to what you're about to what you're about to hear in terms of the technology available um i think i'm handing over to jens alex is that right brilliant thanks nick uh really interesting insight um so yeah i appreciate you uh you sharing there um as you say um we are going to move on to Jens's uh, section here around enabling traceability and provenance. But before we do that, we're just going to uh, put on a video here Bear with us. Supply chains are the arteries of the world economy. But hampered by a lack of real-time data shared between supply chain parties and the paper-based processes used to manage them, they're not flowing well. Inefficiencies such as customs delays cost around $4 trillion a year, while fake goods account for 3% of trade. In our always-on economy, there must be a better way to ensure provenance and speed the flow of goods. Introducing IO to Tangle, the first open source distributed ledger that while similar to blockchain is more scalable and efficient. IOTA works in tandem with Zebra Savannah's cloud data platform. Through Zebra Savannah, an app can send a scan or RFID event directly to the IOTA Tangle by a single API call where it's securely held and tamper proof. Capturing the data requires minimal or no changes to existing processes, and it provides all supply chain agents with a real-time, immutable view of progress. Take a new tyre. An RFID tag is attached to it and recorded to certify its batch, origin and quality. In the warehouse, the RFID tag is recorded to confirm custody, while new data is added including location and warehouse ID. The delivery driver scans the code to confirm transfer of custody, while GPS data can be used to track progress. At Customs, the RFID tag is scanned to access certificates and quickly clear the tyre for import. At the garage, it's registered using a fixed RFID reader. And when fitted, a further scan updates the car's log with the make, date and tyre specs. The customer also reads the code to confirm she has a certified tyre that will keep her family safe. From protecting consumers and fighting counterfeit products to enabling just-in-time logistics, faster product recalls and compliance, IOTA and Zebra Savannah is the all-new way to accelerate your supply chain. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, uh, for, for sharing the wine story. And um, I'm sorry we, we dragged <laughs> a, a tire story into this. Um, but it's uh, from, from our perspective, it's, um, it's, it's a story also about the data and how you secure the data and how you make sure that the, the, the data that, that, that you work with, you know, you have that providence. Um, so so for, for our side, even though we... Um, we, we think wine is, is a very, very interesting uh, case story, of course. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's all types of products that kind of have the same challenges when we talk about provinces, province, provenance in the supply chain. Um, and, um, and if we just break down how we actually can provide that kind of provenance using, using a distributed ledger technologies of blockchain and, uh, and combined with, with the separate technologies here, we um, we see that some certain missing pieces that actually have to come together and that we can provide. And one of them is, of course, first of all, any product has to have some kind of tag. So we have the opportunity to take that product into the to the digital realm. So if we can give it some kind of RFID or QR code and so on. Uh, that allows us to to do a, a digital representation of the product and that's kind of the starting point the next points are that um 
that every actor will have to report data. And, uh, and, and, and even though we have a lot of data today in, in, in the supply chains, most of that data is siloed. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons it's siloed is simply that, that uh, there's not that much trust when you start to share that data with each other, especially when you get one tier or two tiers down the supply chain. So, so the missing piece that, that the distributed ledger technology, in this case, uh, the Tangle IOTA is, is bringing here, is the fact that if you put some data on the Tangle, it becomes immutable. That means that, that you can't change the data on, a, on that record at a later stage, and it's available also at a later stage to actually go back and review. Um, and a third piece that is super important here is not only that the data is immutable, but it's also you have accountability. So you need the identifier of whoever was sharing that data. So these are the three important pieces attack uh, that links a, a product to the digital realm. So you can start to, to, to exchange digitally around the product. The fact that you can start to trust that data uh, and you can find the source who's accountable for that data. So that provides the, um, you know, I would say the fundamental building blocks uh, also for the demo that uh, we're going to show you when we get uh, get more into the, the, the technical details. Alex, could you take the next slide, please? I wanted to show you here, um, uh, give you a little um, uh, previous brief uh, case that we worked with the, with one of our other partners also called Everything. Um, what they do is exactly that they, they're providing the, 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 the SaaS platform for this, but under this, they would use Tangle and they would use um, uh, identifiers. So they're working with a high-end brand called Alex, which is a, which is a high-end uh, T-shirt brand. And uh, they were giving these T-shirts um, a QR code and, and serialization of those. So individual T-shirts would have individual codes um which would allow which would start the whole process so if we, if we take the next slide uh, alex then then the the whole the whole um the whole process here is actually that you give each of these pieces of garment this this code and that that you activate that code and that's of course some of the the, the details that have to to happen but once that happens and i'll ask you if you like you can actually take your phone and, uh, and take a picture of the QR code that is on, on the slide here. Um, and, uh, and, and if you use your browser for that QR code, if you just use your phone and, 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 the, and, and the, the camera on the phone, it will normally automatically suggest you um, the browser that you can open up with. And that's, um, that's one of GS1's uh, digital link standards that I use to this QR code. So it, it get you to that URL. Um, and here, in this one, uh, what you should be able to see is that that different actors, first of all, is this a product authentic? Uh, of course, this is a demo. So in this case, you should be able to see this is authentic and get the report, but you should also be able to, to ask for more information. And if you go to the next slide, Alex, then, then we will get, um, you should see something like this. And what you get here is actually that the different actors are reporting on on this product and when when it was at their hands and that it it went through their hands and in that way we are starting to get the full track of a product that allows for for, for many things um, and 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 one of them is of course the authenticity of the product itself but it's, it can also be uh, in 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 business to business relationships it could be better with the overview of the supply chain, of how the supply chain moves, if you start to be able to track with a supplier one, two, three, four, five, these kind of events and allow you to, um, to, uh, to organize yourself around those kind of events and dates and so on. And, and then interestingly enough, and this is where, where we, uh, we, we can bridge what I would call was two earlier two different worlds, which was the business to business environment and the business to consumer environment, is that we can use the same data because they're available on a, on a, on a public blockchain um, 
to do exactly what you did before, where you scanned the code and you would get the same data. So the consumer, you can actually engage the consumer on this product as well. And you can you can use that for different things. You know, one of them would definitely be what, what Nick talked about was telling the story of where where the wine comes from, um, why why this is a unique piece of wine and, 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 and all these kind of certificates that follows this wine. But it also add, adds something to the consumer value of the product because we're starting to see the, that, that there are experimentations where you use this technology to ensure that the product actually would have a higher price in the second half market, given that once you hand it off and you want to sell it further on, that, um, that actors or, or, or consumer to consumer, secondhand market, can also secure that this is an authentic product, they can have the provenance of the product, and therefore you are increasing uh, the value of the product over time. Um, so these are the, I would say that the, the fundamental building blocks and, and, the, and, and the types of value that, that the, you can actually get out of, of combining the different technologies we have in play here today. Um, and, and of course, this, this, is, this has to work in enablement with, with the QR codes, with the readers or the scanners, RFID you can use as well. If you use RFID tags, you can make them even more secure than QR codes and so on. And I, and the, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we at IOTA Foundation is very, very excited about this uh, partnership with CEPR Technologies because we, we can actually bridge some technologies together and, and make them more accessible uh, and easier uh, to use uh, around the world. So I'll hand over to you, Alex, uh, to talk a little bit more about the, the CEPR side of things. Great, thanks, Jens. So yeah, what I'm gonna just do in a couple of slides here before we um, go into Jose's demo is uh, just build upon uh, what Nick started with, which is a really great insight into the um, perspective from a, um, uh, you know, from where Nick sits in the in the wine industry, and also, of course, we referenced uh, another use case, which was um, car tires in the video that we showed, and then Jens's um, use case around clothing. Um, what I'm going to do is just reference um, uh, Zebra's. Um, uh, you know, perspective and story around end-to-end -end visibility, um, which we, uh, Jens touched on uh, just towards the end there. Uh, and uh, what we are focused on, of course, um, as you know, if you're an existing Zebra partner or if you are uh, a Zebra employee, um, we focus on the uh, the edge devices that exist uh, already out there, the edge Zebra devices, um, to uh, uh, which are already capturing data at the edge. And uh, some of those devices are, let's say, traditional devices like our uh, enterprise mobile computers and scanners that are capturing 1D and 2D barcodes every day. And that is just part of a standard process within a warehouse or a, um, uh, or a retail store or a distribution facility, um, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, but also um, uh, deploying newer, uh, let's say, data capture devices such as RFID readers, as uh, Jens mentioned, and other location devices um, uh, uh, that are capturing new sources of data. In that, in that case, location data. And of course, uh, some of those devices already exist out there. Some devices are um, emerging. And what we are trying to do is uh, essentially make it easier to take data from these devices and share data. And in the uh, topic of provenance and traceability, um, our partnership with IOTA is really important there because the storage and transfer of data, as Jens touched on, and we'll talk about a bit more when we see the demo, um, has significant benefits um, when it comes to being stored and shared across a distributed decentralized ledger like IOTA's Tangle. And uh, Zebra has a uh, data service platform as well, which we have used, and we'll see this um, shortly. Uh, we have used to build proof of concepts and also to build uh, production, uh, let's say, connections between our data capture devices and uh, IOTA's Tangle platform. And our Zebra Savannah uh, 
platform, as I just uh, mentioned high level in the last slide, um, in a bit more detail, collects and analyzes data from our Zebra devices and sensors in real time. So when it references Zebra devices, we're talking about uh, Zebra mobile computers, Zebra printers, Zebra RFID readers, et cetera. Uh, in some cases, we aggregate and, and store that data. But in many cases, those data services are just used for passing the data from the device, for example, an RFID reader, uh, straight over to over Savannah to a cloud platform or a distributed ledger like IoT Tangle. And we'll see that in the demo. Um, and uh, ultimately, the last point, which is important, is we, with Zebra Savannah, we're able to cloud enable our devices to make it make them much simpler to work with, and also um, reduce significantly the infrastructure that's needed locally to uh, enable those devices. For example, with an RFID reader, uh, eliminating the need for local servers and uh, enabling um, essentially a direct connection between the reader and uh, a cloud platform or a decentralized ledger. And from a high level architectural point of view, this is uh, what Savannah looks like. So this is what I described before. You have the edge devices on the left and these devices are connecting to our Zipper Savannah cloud. And then we are enabling access to these data services, essentially enabling access to the data from these devices uh, via REST APIs. And um, uh, this is just setting the scene here for um, the demo that Jose is going to show, um, where we'll show we actually have an API with IOTA on the uh, platform, which uh, enables you to uh, either simulate um, a querying a RFID reader or a, um, uh, or a scanner, um, or actually use a, um, you know, a physically a, an RFID reader and send data over that API to IOTA's distributed ledger in one API call. And that is what we would say is for proof of concepts and, and demoing and testing, the, uh, the yellow box there. But then we also have production APIs like the send file to printer API and the RFID data service API that we've just launched, which um, we would see being used in production scenarios to send data from these devices. And we've touched on some of the use cases before um, for this. Uh, directly to a cloud platform or a decentralized ledger like IOTA's distributed ledger. And it's an important piece on the top right there, which is if you are a partner of Zebra today or an ISV of Zebra today, uh, or if you're not, we'll show you where you can sign up to, uh, to be one later on, um, then this is where really the gap is to uh, uh, meet some of the challenges that were referenced earlier uh, in, in some of the different sectors, including um, uh, Nick talking about the the wine sector, which can expand out to the sort of food and drink sector, some of those challenges. Um, the, the gap is the application that's uh, actually presenting um, the data or the outcome or whatever um, from the data service, which is uh, being delivered by, um, by Zebra and the um, data storage and transfer being delivered by IOTA, um, presenting that through an application to the uh, consumer of the application or the end user customer typically. So this is where we really need ISVs and partners to build applications um, towards the APIs and tool sets that we've developed um, to build the final solution, essentially. We have the building blocks with IOTA. We have, of course, our edge devices. We have the data services. We have um, IOTA's uh, distributed ledger, which is you know, production ready. Uh, but the application layer is really where we see the opportunity for our partner network to, to step in. So with that, um, I'm now going to hand it over to Jose for the demo piece. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So um, <clears throat> essentially, I'm going to introduce uh, this demo. This demo, the, the main uh, purpose is to uh, detect, detect fraud and even prevent fraud in in, uh, in products. So the example is, is wine, but it can be applied to other products. So essentially, we are using, we are going to use uh, RFID, RFID tags that are attached to uh, the wine, to the product, to the final product. It can be a bottle, it, it can be just uh, a box, 
And with these tags, we are going to uh, be able to detect if the product is authentic or it is not authentic. And the solution includes different uh, technologies developed by, uh, by IOTA. So it includes identity technologies. So you are able to identify winemakers, wine importers, any kind of actor in the supply chain. And on the other hand, involves the usage of RFID. With RFID, we are able to define some data associated to the product, essentially the APC, but also there are some data in the, in the tag itself, like the tag identification data that can also be used to detect possible fraud. And uh, this is done uh, in combination with the distributed ledger. So in the distributed ledger, there is going to be associated to this tag certain transactions that are associated or can be used to verify the authenticity of a product. Uh, all this uh, um, demo is based on our uh, IOTA APIs that Alex has mentioned before, and is based also on uh, uh, standards from, from GS1, particularly the EPCIS uh, standard. Also, the identity standards are related, are the uh, uh, compliant with the W3C standards on decentralized identities and verifiable credentials. Uh, it's important to understand as well that we are going to, or the, 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 the proposal we are making here can be applied in business to business scenarios. So for instance, a winemaker and a wine importer, they need, they, they need to trudge each other on the wine they are selling and the wine that they are receiving, but also on the business to consumer for provenance, for provenance uh, data, because these different events and this different traceability that, has been, that is going to be stored on the distributed ledger can uh, fill both purposes. So if we can go to the next slide, we can see uh, the principles of the solution. So here we have the, the winery, which is uh, commissioning a box of bottles of wine. And there, the commissioning implies a certain device event, event, a print event, particularly. And this device event actually is going to have uh, some signature associated to the, to the winemaker that makes uh, the, the box uh, unique. And on the other hand, we are going to have a series of business events. Business events are more high level events. So a device event is like a print, I printed with this printer, and a business event is this supply chain item, like the boss of, of bottles of wine, is now uh, live and it's now in the digital world, and it is a commissioning event. Once the, the bottle of wine uh, is printed and this transaction is recorded on the tangle, is the transaction that we can see uh, here, um, the, the bottle of wine is moving, is moving to the wine importer side. And when the wine importer receives the, the, um, the box with the bottles of wine, there is an RFID attached to the bottle of wines, and then it is read. When it is read, the uh, importer can uh, uh, check the authenticity of the, uh, of the uh, box of the, or of the boxes just uh, using our technology. How? Because it is able to query uh, what is the transaction. It is able to ask the winery, the original winery, who is the transaction, what is the transaction that certifies that that uh, bottle of wine or a box of bottles of wine is authentic. And once the transaction is uh, obtained, uh, the winemaker can verify can verify a signature inside that transaction, verifying that the, uh, the, the authenticity of the, uh, of the box. Of course, if the wine maker uh, does not know anything about that box, then the, the wine importer will, will notice that and will assign that box as suspect of, being, of not being authentic, as we will show in the, in the demo. And, and on the other hand, last but not least, the 
in the in the last uh, stages of the supply chain at the retailer or even at the consumer side the consumer also will be able to as we saw previously will be able to query those events and obtain all the supply chain data trail associated to the wine that is being bought and all these events are uh, secure on the iota stangle and they are of course immutable and uh, <clears throat> and secure so and it's important that you understand the difference between the device events that are just what the device has read of has scanned and the business events which are higher level events for instance the storing the storing event when the warehouse receives the bottle of wine and is stored or uh, when the uh, at the supermarket the retailer is uh, has sold the the wine and another event is is recorded so this is the 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 demonstration and i now i, I will make it uh, live so uh, if you give me the control okay okay so now uh, we need to see uh, two different, uh, the different aspects that we have to consider in this demo. In this demo, we have the importer and we have the maker, okay? And the importer and the maker, they have a decentralized identity. So a decentralized identity it is essentially a, a, a pair of public and private keys, and the public key is immutably recorded on the, on the tangle. It means that the maker and the importer they can trust each other because they have registered their identities on the iota stand so here i have already generated the maker and the importer decentralized identities and then there is the credentials so the credentials are like the the profile of the maker and the importer and those credentials uh usually will be signed by by uh, a trusted authority or in this case in this example we are just uh, making it making that self-signed self but in this case the important thing is that we are associating in the case of the maker with their credential what is the gs1 company prefix associated to the credential that is an important point why because what we are saying is that the uh, the the maker is the owner of the epcs so the 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 um, tag identifiers which company prefix is this one and this is the authority and it is the one who is going to know what epcs are really have been printed and what epcs have not printed but also he will be able to verify if if the uh, tags are the tags, the authentic tags that were used initially, or they are not. So what we are going to do now is we are going to use a small application that is built on top of the APIs that uh, Alex has mentioned. And this application is going to uh, uh, perform all, all the, uh, in, in a conceptual basis, of course, the flow that would be followed by the maker and by the importer. So for doing so, I'm going to go uh, to the um, to the application. So here, the we are going to, to first enter the credential of the maker. So we enter the credential of the maker. And now we are registered as a maker. OK, so here we are going to uh, print uh, a tag. So in this case, we'll be printer in printing in a certain uh, printer from a certain business location, which can be the, 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 uh, vinery, the winery or, or, or whatever. And here we are, we are going to, imprint, to print uh, this GTI, which is an EPC, as you know, and this is going to be the, the authentic one. Okay, so here also it's important the tag information data associated because the tag information data of the of the of the RFID tag is going to allow us to verify the authenticity 
uh, in, just in case someone just creates an, RF, an RFID tag which just contains the same ID. So to avoid that uh, possible problem, what we do is we use the tag information data as a double check to verify that uh, the tag is actually authentic and as a result, the bottle of wine or the box of wine is authentic as well. So here we are doing the, the print here. The, the, we are adding some data related to the to the um, uh, to the to the bottle of wine or to the wine, and then we are going to print. So remember that this is the authentic one, and this is the the information. So when we go to print, now what is going to happen is that we are registering the print event on the tangle. It means that we have recorded using the IOTA uh, APIs on the tangle a couple of transactions that are verifying that this event happened and that the uh, winemaker is the owner of, of, the, uh, <clears throat> of that uh, pieces of wine, piece, uh, uh, boxes of wine. So this transaction, you can see it here. So here you can see the transaction and you can see that there is a proof. This proof is just what will allow later, together with this transaction, to the wine, uh, to the wine um, importer will allow him to verify the authenticity. OK, so now we have printed. Also, what we are uh, doing here is as well we are generating the business events. The business events are the GS1 and PCI's events associated to what we are doing. So now our um, item has been commissioned in this case. So now if we go to our inventory, so the winemaker has, uh, has in, in the inventory this, this item. Imagine that now the item moves, moves to the to the winemaker, uh, to the wine importer place. So the wine importer uh, has another application. So the wine importer uh, can enter into the application as well. And now in his inventory does not have anything. So what is happened now is that through the RFID reader is going to come an event to the application with a new read and that event is coming through the RFID data services that was mentioned by Alex before. So with that event from that from which from we from our application will be just received from a webhook will come the reading of the box and depending on, on what it comes from that uh, read read event we will be able to verify the authenticity. How? Because the uh, the wine importer will be able to associate uh, uh, an identifier to, uh, from the tag that will allow him to contact the wine uh, uh, the wine uh, maker and to check for the authenticity and for reporting the authenticity the authenticity the wine maker will just provide a reference to the transaction on the tangle that will allow the wine importer to actually verify verify the authenticity. So first, we are going to start with with a non-authentic a non authentic, um, a non, a non -authentic um, um, <clears throat> tag. So here we have the, the prepare the authentic one, but we have a couple of them which are actually uh, non authentic. So if we go uh, to the uh, to the to the ones which to the one which is non-authentic, which is actually unknown, and we execute, so and we refresh here, we will see that uh, a one which is has a totally different serial number than our one has has been has arrived. But it has not it has not been able to verify it because in the, uh, the the winemaker does not know anything about it. I cannot prove anything about it. 
So now we have another case, which is the case where we have uh, the same EPC. So someone has, has uh, written a, 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 an RFID tag with the same EPC, but of course the tag identifier has varied a bit. So it is not the same tag, but it contains the same EPC. And in this case, what is going to happen is that it is not going to be recognized as authentic. So now, what is happening is that we have received it, but it is not uh, verified and in principle cannot be verified, even though the same EPC has been received. But the problem is that the tax uh, has, has been considered as non authentic. If we go finally to the authentic one and we send the trans, we send the, the read. Then we can refresh here. And now, yes, now the winemaker has been able to verify the authenticity, not only of the of uh, that the EPC is known by the winemaker, but also that the right tag has been received. And here you will see you will have a pointer to the transaction that has allowed him to verify that the authenticity of the box of the box of bottles of wine. And if you go to the uh, events that we have on the tangle, you will see that now we have not only the event uh, of commissioning, but also the event of storing the uh, the item in the in the warehouse. So this is this is the, the the demo I want I wanted to present and how uh, using the identity using the ES1 identifiers and using the tangle and using some cryptographic techniques together with the tangle we can verify the authenticity of items in the supply chain and particularly the authenticity of uh, of wine uh, bottles or of wine boxes. So um, now uh, I'm handing over again to 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 Alex. If you can give me present uh, the yes. So um, just to conclude, uh, a picture of the architecture of the of the solution. So the the important or uh, the most important parts on we base the solution is the track and trace ledger APIs. These APIs are, not, are available on Zebra Savannah as a, as a sandbox, but also are available to, to be used in uh, production environments. We have like um, <clears throat> the RFID data services. So this, this request that you saw before is the request that will be made by an RFID reader actually through RFID data services to, to, a, to a webhook. We have, of course, the authenticity and the verification services. They are just uh, web applications um, that uh, use make use of the APIs to record the transactions on the Tangle, to uh, verify uh, those transactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the APIs is what uh, make uh, this application easy to be to be built and uh, using the same APIs and the same data, different applications like the consumer application might be built. It, it would be not, not very difficult to, to create applications in, in, different, uh, in different domains uh, for related, related to authenticity using these APIs that they are quite generic and relay on the, on the powerful capabilities of the distributed ledger. So if we go to to next slide, remember that you can use these APIs from the Zebra Savannah environment for free. You can test them, and you can and, and remember that they will be using the capabilities of the DevNet from IOTA and the Zebra Savannah, but also they can be used in production environments. And actually, the decentralized identifiers we were using, etc., in the demo I saw, they are actually on the main of of, of IOTA. So 
there is the possibility of moving these applications to a uh, production or to a pilot stage without without problem. Great. Thanks very much, Jose. Uh, really great demo. Um, so I'm just going to race through a couple of last slides so that we can get to uh, Q and A. So Jose uh, just went through there um, to make sure it's clear, distinguishing that we have a, a POC demo environment with IOTA, which is live on Savannah, and as Jose said, is completely free to go in and test. And you can find that on the um, Zebra Savannah um, developer portal. It's called the Track and Trace API. And then for production and um, use cases, we, uh, as uh, Jose had in his demo, we um, see the RFID and print APIs having some uh, really great use cases, sending data directly to the IoT stream, uh, which is uh, um, the uh, transaction route towards the IoT uh, distributed ledger. So go and check those out after the um, session. Um, Zebra and IoT have been working together for um, a good uh, almost two years now, and we have great synergy in our products, as you can see. And also, um, you know, from a from a corporate point of view, so we are we are strategic partners, and we just wanted to um, to point that out. If you are a uh, if you're an ISV or partner, then and you want to uh, have a discussion about this beyond just doing some testing, and um, send a note to your account manager, and be happy to um, to get in touch, and also put you in touch with with IOTA. Um, if you're not a partner, then um, sign up to Partner Connect, and we can we can do the same. Uh, if you just Google Zebra Partner Connect, you'll find all the details in the sign up process. So with that, um, we'll, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left for some uh, questions and answers, which we've seen some, some come through. Um, uh, so uh, just to show you as well, again, the developer sites and the GitHub site and also the Saffron Grange site, please go and check that out after and uh, learn a bit more about Saffron's uh, story. Um, uh, I'm going to ask this first question that I can see to uh, Jens, I think. This is one for you. Um, the question is, how do you, how does IOTA Foundation um, uh, compete or complement um, what IBM are doing in the blockchain space? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I can see the questions, but thanks for reading it up. Um, so, if we're talking about, I mean, there there's, there's multiple technologies out there that that is uh, distributed ledger uh, technologies, and uh, and um, I would assume that your reference that that the IBM is part of a hyperledger uh, and contributing to the hyperledger. Um, uh, and I think one of the main there are some there are some differences. Um, one of them is that the IOTA Tangle is a truly permissionless ledger. Uh, where is in, in in you know the hyperledger and we're getting very technical here, but but the the, the hyperledger setup is uh, is uh, is a bit different. It's a permissioned. You need to form a committee up front of 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 participating nodes and so on. So and I, I'm I'm maybe I'm a little bit biased here, but I would believe that it's it would be easier and it is easier to uh, to uh, to build on top of a, of a, of the tangle. Um, you can set up private tangles as well, but you will actually be able to transfer them into the permissionless uh, world as well. Um, but I think in general, IBM is actually building on many more technologies than that. And um, and I've seen some uh, some sentiments from them that they, they want to be a little bit more um, uh, agnostic to the underlying technology. I'm not sure that answering the question, but that was just some high level uh, thoughts on, on, on IBM and and Thanks, Jens. Um, another one here, I think this might be one for you, Jose. Um, what events are, or perhaps can be stored in the IOTA ledger, and uh, is this information accessible by anyone publicly? So perhaps how do you, how can the Tangle gatekeep access to the to the data that's yeah. stored? Yes, that, that's a very that's a very good question. So the the data we store on the Tangle is properly encrypted. So it's, it's uh, based on our IOTA streams technology that allows to create uh, channels which are like uh, chains of different events that are linked between each other. 
but at the same time, these channels can be defined as private. So essentially, only those partners in the supply chain that have the proper keys can get access to the, to the data. And the indexing of these channels and the association between the channels and the items in the supply chain is like the magic that it is done by the by the Zebra, sorry, by the by the IOTA APIs. And in the case of the example we've been showing, in the in this example, the association between DPC and for instance the print transactions is it, that is done by this component, and all the keys are kept are kept secret secret and at the, uh, at the same time, of course, thanks to those keys, the data is stored and created on the, on the target. So it can be decided uh, not to, to have any of the information public, of course. Great. Thanks, Jose. Um, so we're at, the, we're at the top of the hour now. Um, big thanks to, to Nick for joining in and, um, and doing the, the section at the beginning and the cost to Tienz and Jose from Iota and everyone for joining. The session was recorded. If you think you've got colleagues that will be interested to listen, just go back to the registration link and you can listen back. And any follow-up questions, feel free to, to get in touch. Thank you very much, everyone.